and welcome back to Lunches with Legends, where we connect with some of the most illustrious business leaders in the world while supporting vital healthcare organizations in our communities. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our very special guest today, the uh, legendary Stephen Polos. Uh, Steve is a widely recognized economist with nearly 40 years of experience in financial markets, forecasting, economic policy, and of course, the public sector. Most recently, Steve served as the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada, Canada's central bank. And prior to that, uh, Steve was the president and CEO of Export Development Canada, where he served, uh, also served as, as chief economist. In addition, he held senior roles with BCA Research, as well as serving as a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C., and at the Economic Planning Agency in Tokyo. He's a frequent speaker and writer who has taught uh, economics at the University of Western Ontario, where he also received his PhD, uh, as well as Concordia University and Queen's School of Business. Currently, Steve is the uh, special advisor at Osler, where he provides clients with strategic guidance regarding the financial system, trade, and economic policy, both domestically and on a global scale. And in addition, he serves on a variety of private, public, and charitable boards, such as Enbridge, CGI, and Lawrence National Center. Steve is also the author of the upcoming book titled uh, The Next Age of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future, that maps out the uh, powerful economic forces that are shaping our future. Hopefully, we'll be able to delve into some of these uh, concepts today, which I'm uh, extremely excited about. And Steve, thank you so very much for joining us for this conversation. Well, thank you, Mo. It's it's a pleasure to be here, and hello to everyone out there. It's 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 a, it's a pleasure. Thank you. So, Steve, so let's let's just um, go back to the beginning. I mean, obviously, you've achieved um, one of the highest uh, echelons of public service in this country. Um, can you just, but if we go a little bit further back. Can you share uh, with us a little bit about your upbringing and perhaps, as I always ask our guests, some of the formative events uh, that shaped who you are and perhaps contributed to your success? Well, sure, Mo, well, it's a natural place to start, I guess. Uh, I had a very modest upbringing uh, down in Oshawa. It was, uh, you know, my dad was a tool and die maker. My mom was a homemaker, except in the stressful times she, where she would do some office work to bring in some extra money. There were no extras around the house. Um, and in fact, a formative event in 1968, my parents uh, lost their home um, basically because of a long strike at my father's uh, employer. And uh, not it, it just you know it was too long of a stretch in order to sustain uh, mortgage payments and so on. Hmm. So we ended up moving into my grandparents' house, which was a small wartime, you know, the kind of house that was built for the returning veterans in the mid forties. Um, hard to believe that my grandparents raised five kids in that house uh, and had no idea how they did it. Uh, but I was about to find out because, you know, the family of four moved, moved in yeah. and my grandparents moved upstairs. The one thing I was not short of when I was young Mo, was jobs. <laughs> okay, so I did uh, lawn cutting from a really young age, snow shoveling. I, I was in my early teens, I was working in construction for a swimming pool company. As soon as I was 16, I was working at Eaton's in the record department. You know, the, I don't know what you call it today, but anyway, where you buy, buy music anyway. <laughs> and I used to play the organ for wedding receptions, and I had my own DJ business for mostly, you know, curling monspiels and weddings and that kind of thing that took me all through high school and my undergraduate years. There was no money for university. I had to do that completely on my own with the caveat that I, I was married pretty young at the age of 20 to my high school sweetheart from grade 10. So we got married pretty early and she worked throughout. So she was basically paying the rent and uh, putting groceries on the table uh, all through those uh, university years. All this by way of saying, I think I was highly motivated throughout my life to try to do better than all of that, right? And so there was a there was a lot of motivation there. Education was key, uh, but I was really driven to uh, to a higher higher goal. And and with all that motivation and aspiration and uh, like, what were 
some of those original professional aspirations? Like, what did you want to become? Why? What did your parents hope you'd become? And, and maybe who were some of the uh, role models that you had uh, in, in um, uh, on the professional role? Yeah, I think, I think uh, as a kid, my, maybe my teachers were some of my best role models. You know, you just saw certain ones were in it to do the job, but others were in it just because they loved doing it. And, and so observing that, but, but from, from my perspective, the pinnacle of society seemed to be my doctor or my, <laughs> dentist, or my dentist, right? They were the top echelon of society and that's where I wanted to go. Uh, and uh, I would go to school and go as far as I could and, get, and maybe become a doctor. That was basically the core plan. It was heavily recommended by my parents um, and I'm putting it uh, mildly. Um, I went to Queens in 1974 with that plan, you know, to take all the usual pre-med science and math courses and, and apply to med school. And, uh, but they force you to take an option. You, you have one blank in your schedule, if that's your track. And I just got to that great big book of possibilities. Uh, do you think I could choose something? No, you know, I didn't know what I would take. Philosophy, well, that sounds too easy, or I don't know, like it just, it just didn't. Anyway, so some somebody I met uh, in my first week on campus said, uh, try economics. I did that first year. It was a lot of fun. And uh, and so I saw, oh, and read up on it. And I was like, yeah, that does sound pretty cool. And so I did. And I fell in love with it. <laughs> so I tried to keep my options open. I kept, kept taking all the pre-med courses, but I switched my major to economics in my second year and took lots of economics. And in the end, I never applied to med school. Uh, much to the disappointment of my parents. <laughs> um, and, and from the beginning, you know, I knew that I wanted to, uh, I'll put it this way, do economics. It's like not just learn economics, but actually practice it as a policymaker. If possible, as soon as I had discovered what it was, I decided I wanted to be at the Bank of Canada. <laughs> that sounded like the coolest place to be. Uh, and in fact, I decided while an undergraduate, in fact, in my first year at Queens, that that's what I would try to do, try to end up working at the Bank of Canada. And I envisioned being governor someday and having my signature on the money. But way back in 1974. That is wild. That is absolutely wild. I mean, first of all, two things. One, I've, I've interviewed uh, remarkable, some of the most incredible people around the world. And I can't tell you how commonly I hear the refrain, my parents were disappointed that I wasn't a doctor. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But, uh, but I think just coming back to your story and having that vision to become a central banker. And, and again, for most of us, even on this call, we, we don't meet too many central bankers. We don't meet too many heads of the bank of Canada or Japan or whatever else. Um, what, what are, I mean, I guess retroactively and then, and then obviously um, uh, post your experience, what are the most important qualities and skills that one needs to have to be this a central banker or to be the head of the Bank of Canada? Yeah, well, viewed from back then in, in 1974, just getting started in economics, to me, it looked like the ultimate technician's job. You know, you would learn how to do it, learn and learn and learn and do very specific, very focused and obviously very influential. You know, like you, you think about you're going to be a doctor and, you, and it's great. It's so, so cool that you can help people one at a time and and they get better and all that stuff. Um, uh, whereas with with economics can be very powerful. You can make millions of people better, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe only a little bit, but it's it feels very powerful. So so to me, it seemed like a highly technical job in that sense. So, but in fact, what I learned is it's not, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's a highly generalist type of job. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to being a brain surgeon, it's more like a family doctor, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, it requires a lot of ability to learn on the job because the, the context is always changing. Uh, what economics is, is always changing. Just the way medicine, you know, you hope that your doctor is up 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 uh, to date with the latest things, right? That's that's what they do, and so same thing with an economist. It's always evolving. So you need to learn on the job, and I think intuition uh, is more powerful than than rigor and math and statistics. You know, the more instinctive understanding of how the economy works, 
proved to be more valuable to me. Uh, communication turns out to be highly critical uh, to the job. Who knew, uh, you know, how important that would be and how difficult. Uh, and so for me, I think the time that I spent uh, practical time with actual companies while I was at EDC really gave me a grounded appreciation for how the economy actually works, who to talk to when you don't understand what's going on. That was proved to be extremely valuable uh, to me. And, and so for those of those, uh, obviously all of us on the call have said, uh, read about the, the actions of central banks and central bankers, but maybe just, just to level set for everybody here who's unfamiliar, <laughs> who may be unfamiliar, what is the ultimate purpose and mission of the central bank? And to what extent do you believe <clears throat> that at least the Bank of Canada has lived up to that purpose uh, and mission? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a very lofty kind of, uh, vision or purpose uh, in, the, in the legislation, the preamble to the Bank of Canada Act says something like uh, the, the purpose of the Bank of Canada, which was, which was created in 1937, was to regulate credit and currency in the best interests of the economic life of Canada. Hmm. I mean, that, if you're in charge of that, that sounds pretty cool, right? right? Right away. And it's a high and noble purpose. Casual observers today tend to think, well, it's you're supposed to target inflation, and that, and actually they also think it's a fairly mechanical job. It's like mm -hmm. it's like making sure your car works properly. So a mechanic says, no, 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 this needs to be adjusted, you know, whatever, to be just perfect. It's nothing like that. Targeting inflation is really just a means to an end. It's a it, it produces a predictable macroeconomic environment and a strong financial system. That enables people to get on with their lives, mm -hmm. their jobs, their businesses, their big economic decisions. The economy won't go anywhere if people can't make good decisions, right? So you think of it as, uh, as the Bank of Canada making the context better so that people can do it better. Right. So the economy grows faster, creates more jobs and all those kinds of things. Um, and the only tool you really have is interest rates. They go up or they go down. Uh, there are other jobs that the bank does, which aren't as obvious to the, as those, but like keeping, you know, supply of bank notes, you know, you, pr you probably have some money in your pocket. I have the same roughly $200 in my pocket that I've had since the beginning of the pandemic. I, I think I basically use it in parking garages, maybe, and that's about all, uh, or for a tip occasionally. Uh, but, but so, and also the bank is the banker for the government. That's an important job. The government has a huge business model and they need a banker that runs that runs uh, their borrowing runs their cash balances all those kinds of things so runs the financial system in that in that uh, sense with that home base but anyway the main one is moving interest rates around to try and keep the situation on an even keel help the economy adjust if it gets shocked somehow uh, help the economy uh, progress uh, in the right situations all those kinds of things and, and, and to what extent do you think it has lived up to that to that purpose, to that mission objective? Sorry, say again? To what extent do you think the Bank of Canada has oh, lived up? Oh, yeah, right. Well, look, um, that's that's a hard thing to measure. I mean, I, I, my sense of it is it's it's throughout the, the history that I'm most familiar with, let's say, uh, from, from the Bank of Canada, say from the 70s onwards, uh, it was a matter of what was hitting the economy and what, what could the Bank of Canada do about it. And, um, and you could say, you could look at the 1970s probably and say, well, that was an abject failure. You know, uh, inflation went up to double digits, you know, and then of course we had these big recessions to try and get things back on track. Uh, but then I think basically from 1990 onwards, uh, I think the, the, with a framework that was well established that was guiding uh, decision making, that's, in, that's inflation targeting as the means to an end. I think that's been pretty successful. Mm. You know, there, the economy has been hit by lots of things and we managed to do okay uh, <laughs> despite those things. And that's uh, maybe about all you can hope for. And I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. I'd love to, to dive into um, some of the crises that we've experienced and how, how you've navigated that. But just on a, on a light note, you've hung out with Ben Bernanke and Jay Powell and Mario Draghi. What was uh, most memorable about some of those interactions? 
Uh, well, we have a motto in central banking community. What, what happens in Basel stays in Basel. <laughs> uh, because the, the central bankers all get together every second month and, uh, and exchange their views and have, have dinner together and that kind of thing. And, uh, but, but, you know, I can tell you that the, the Sunday night dinner in Basel, where there's the top dozen or so central banks in the world, and you're at that table and you're seated with, you know, kind of, it's all randomized who you end up seating with, um, and you're enjoying a group discussion on key issues. That is like, that's the pinnacle of collaboration and sharing. My very, I tell you my very first one, uh, which was, you know, in, in June of 2013, I'd never been, I'd been to Basel when I was a youngster in, 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 at the Bank of Canada, but uh, not to the governor's meetings, of course. And I'd never been, and no one really told me much uh, about what it was like. They just said, you know, you show up, you know, so, and, you know, you go to these meetings. Well, so the first thing you do is go to dinner. And so uh, when I came off the elevator that night, the first person I see standing near the elevator is, is Ben Bernanke, Chair Bernanke. So I thought, oh, well, no time like the present. So I just walked up and I said, oh, Mr. Chairman, you know, my name is Steve Polas. I'm, I'm from the Bank of Canada. And he looks at me in only the way that, you know, the way that only Ben Kennedy. Steve, I, I know who you are. And uh, just by the way, around here, they call me Ben. And so, you know, that sort of set the tone right away. And then Mervyn King came over and said, Steve, welcome to the group. Blah, blah, blah. Come on and sit, sit with me and Ben for dinner. You know, it's like, it's a long way from uh, from growing up in Oshawa to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was fun. No, that, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, so let's let's come back to your to the role and uh, particularly in crisis. Um, I'd be interested in you know a what you're most proud of, and then b you know how how you think that we as a country navigated the last crisis, which is uh, the pandemic. Uh, versus the 2008 crisis, uh, and what were some of the learnings from that? Yeah, well, yeah, in, in 2008, uh, I was the head of lending at Export Development Canada. As it turned out, uh, what we did was we helped a lot of Canadian household name companies get through the crisis. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, it was a financial crisis, and banks around the world, including our own, you know, shrank the availability of credit um quite significantly if you had a credit line of 20 million or 100 million at the bank in, in your in your uh, syndicate of banks uh that could that could go from 100 down to 20 overnight because they just didn't want uh, much more credit going out the door well so edc was asked to lend domestically to help fill that gap temporarily you know while the crisis was on and i think that's that was one tool that most other countries did not have. And I think it's one of the reasons we did better in 2008 than other countries. But the fact is it was a crisis that went on and on and on, like from phase to phase to phase and new tools were being developed through along the way. Well, the COVID shock looked completely different. It happened just so quickly. And, and what happened was everybody said, well, this is gonna look a lot like 2008. So we might as well get all those tools up and going right away. We're going to end up putting everything into this. And so as a consequence, we never really even had a crisis in, hmm. in this. Uh, it, 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 there were, of course, some touch and go days. And if you're holding stocks that hurt, you know, as things went down, I understand this. But, you know, if you look back on it, you say, well, OK, we got all that back if you if you if you played it right or didn't play anything at all, you know, you're 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 back to where he began. So that's okay. And that's just an indicator of how the economy did. Uh, so the response, especially the fiscal response, the government's response, putting in place programs that were elastic, so they would get bigger or smaller, depending on how much COVID affected the economy, mm -hmm. and putting it in place like within a couple of weeks. And if you've applied for CERB, man, that week you got, you got some money from CERB. Mm -hmm. This has never been done before. Uh, the result is that the economy, of course, the economy as we measure it, GDP went down by 20%. But after um, but with, within three months, it was back to 97% of where it started. Mm -hmm. And that 3% was, you know, the people who were truly shut out, you know, the restaurants, the bars, the gyms, uh, you know, the whole entertainment business. So so that uh, that was actually, I don't, I have no regrets over that at all. I think we mm -hmm. What we did learn from that there is that automatic 
kinds of fiscal policy can be extremely powerful mm -hmm. in stabilizing the economy, much more powerful than interest rates. If you cut interest rates to, to help the economy adjust, well, it takes six or nine months for, for much to happen. You know, if the government does it through something like the CERB, it only took a week mm -hmm. for the money to be there and for people to be spending it and keeping the economy running. So I think that was the most important learning. And, and like, look, a lot of people have been asking about some unexpected consequences of these interventions. Yeah. How, do, how did you guys at the Central Bank think about second order consequences and how should we think about it today? Well, you said a key word there and that was second order. That, that's an important word, not just a, a, a quick one. My metaphor for this is uh, you have a conversation with your doctor and he says, okay, you need this surgery. Otherwise, I think you're going to die. And you're like, wow, uh, that's terrible news. But won't that surgery be painful? And the doctor's like, well, of course it's going to be painful. What are you talking about? But it, that's a second order problem. The first order problem is to keep you alive. And the economy is exactly like that. A big shock comes along like COVID. The economy could fall into the second Great Depression. Mm -hmm. It literally could. All the ingredients were present. So you do everything you can to prevent that. Okay. Before you know it, people are on you like, oh, those low interest rates are causing house prices to go up. Oh, those low interest rates are causing stock markets to go up too much. Oh, those low interest rates are making rich people richer and yeah. hurting average people. Well, those things are all true in a way, but they're second order issues because everybody would suffer if we had the second great depression. Right. Right. And so by solving that, you know, we're into the we're into the tip of the iceberg kind of issue then. Uh, these these things, of course, require that people understand the counterfactual. Once they've forgotten that there was no crisis, there was no depression, then they're still worried about the second order effects. Right. You need to remind them that, gosh, it could have looked a lot different. So we have to live with a few of these for a little while until right. things get completely normalized. Okay. No, thank you. That's 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 great. And so that that's retroactively now. Like if we look forward. And, and, and maybe the place I'll start is with uh, the fact you wrote this book that's being released in February and we'll certainly post and how people could pre-order, but the, the name of the book, the, the, I think it's called the, the Next Age of Uncertainty, right? How the right. world can adapt to risk your future. So what did you find most insightful going through that book writing process? And, and maybe if you could, uh, aside from that, give our participants a few teasers or some of the major themes of the book like uh, uh, that would be great. Sure well look I, I can tell you that writing a book um, turns out to be harder than I thought that, that's for sure. You get an appreciation for just how hard it is in fact the thing is I've been writing all my life and I thought well, that would be pretty easy but you know I, I just you just write longer you know, uh, but, <laughs> but actually, uh, it, I've never written anything so sweeping or, or and I've never written anything really working solo, not since my, my dissertation at university, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're used to having staff, and research assistants, and people that get your data, and then high level people like, you know, in the Bank of Canada, you're surrounded by some of the most smart people, amazing people. And they're like, Oh, I read this. Uh, you should you should read it. And they tell you, oh, yeah, so I'm going to read that. Or, or they read your stuff and say, oh, you know, this isn't very clear. You know, you really should say it like this. You know, well, you know, you didn't have any of that. And on top of which, you don't tell anybody you're writing a book. See, if you say, oh, I'm working on a book. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm working on a book. Oh, wow. Well, what happens if it doesn't go anywhere? You feel pretty dumb, right? I mean, it's like, what, what happened to your book? Well, nothing, you know. So you're stealing time away from family, friends, and other pursuits, and you don't even explain to anybody why. Uh, nowadays, when I read a good book, I realize, boy, that's an achievement. I, I understand now why that's so good. And originally, I was motivated to write this because I wanted to, to persuade people and companies that they needed to think longer term. You know, I, I was an anti-short-termism you know, quarterly results kind of uh, notion that I had in my mind. And so I wanted to identify the forces that are longer term that you should be most concerned about strategically in your business, and never mind all that up and down of quarter to quarter. And so the book does, it, it identifies five 
forces, I call them tectonic forces because they're so big and slow moving, operating in the economy, and identify how some of those forces have given rise to major events in the past, like the Great Depression or the Great Inflation of the 70s. And those forces actually are growing in power today, so they can produce much bigger bouts of volatility in the future. And so uh, I'll just give you an example like population aging. You everybody knows population aging, the baby boom generation gave this big bump in the population. And now we're people like me, we're into the retirement phase of life. And what does it really mean? It's for the whole world. The whole world means the whole world will have slower growth in the workforce and therefore slower economic trend growth and lower interest rates like for, for a generation, well, for a generation. So the second half of the book takes the, those forces and asks, how will we adapt to this riskier future? Things like the future of work, the future of housing, uh, corporate performance measures, that sort of thing. I, I, I'm hopeful that the book will inform uh, conversations both at the kitchen table and at the boardroom table. Yeah, no, I think I think that's great. I mean, maybe I could just double click on the demographic question. Like, what? Um, and and I, I I think it's a sort of a known fact that demographics have been shrinking. But um, a is there anything that could reverse that course? Um, and b if even if you those that course is not reversed, are there any other factors that could overcome the demographic challenges? Well, as I said, it's a global issue, not a Canadian issue. But that, what that does mean, though, is that countries within the world can resist that trend, right, by having higher immigration levels. Canada is a leader in, in this space. But I think as it, as it becomes more obvious to the rest of the world that the workforce is not growing like it used to be, other countries will, will begin to see that as kind of a competition for immigrants. Okay, mm -hmm. So we won't have our own party uh, like we've had We've had our own way for a long time. Yeah. Uh, we can also boost our labor force participation right here at home. That's another way to, uh, to reduce this issue. So that's what funding childcare is about. That's to get another couple of points into the, uh, into the workforce, women primarily. And that's the sort of policy that can pay for itself by boosting economic growth and therefore government tax revenues flow in as a result. Uh, but setting aside the supply workers, the best way to counter this the slow growth trend is not demographic really at all. It's through higher productivity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that that comes from investment in existing technology, in new technology, and in infrastructure. And Canada has been a laggard on all these fronts uh, for years, uh, not because we don't do those things, but because productivity gets held back by various things like trade restrictions or inefficiencies in our tax system, regulatory frameworks, permitting rules, just say red tape kind of in general. And so I think addressing the headwinds to productivity growth will, will bear more fruit than you know trying somehow to boost investment. Companies will invest if you if you give them the daylight in order to uh, to do it. Yeah, I mean, let me actually again come back to that. That's it's a, um, you mentioned that we've kind of uh, been under investing in technology or I think you alluded to that. And when you think about Canada, we all are aware of the concentration of Canadian wealth, largely tied into the things that either come out of the ground, the real estate itself, and some of the financing activity around that. Like that's that's a massive, disproportionate uh, uh, segment of our economy. What are some of the implications of that? And as you and one of the questions that came up was uh, housing. Um, uh, how how are you seeing that that being affected? So. Broad question, what concentration of Canadian wealth and, and housing specifically? Right, so, I mean, look, Canada, I always like to ask people, do you, do you think you'd be better off to have these things in the ground or, do you, or would you rather be a country without any of those things in the ground? Well, most people, when you ask it that way, say, well, I'm glad we've got great farmland and forests and lots of water and a fishery and oil and natural gas and lots of hydroelectric power, nuclear, uh, all the ingredients we need for nuclear, uh, metals, minerals, all that stuff. So if you if you had to buy all that from somebody else, well, that wouldn't be as good, right? So mm -hmm. this, it's not a curse, it's an endowment. It's, it's uh, it, it, we, we can be, you become dependent on them, but, but that's because you have them. Now mm -hmm. we've been far better off having them. 
uh, and we will be in the future too. So I think there's a very long future of, of those businesses uh, prospering in the world. If you, if you go back to a book I had to read in university in, the, in around 1971, uh, uh, so 72 rather was when it was published and that's The Limits to Growth uh, published by the, the Club of Rome. So now it's 50 years old, that book. I mean, it was totally wrong. But, but, but the thing is, it, it gave you an indication they had actually figured out we were going to run out of copper by 1999. Mm -hmm. turned, out, turned out not to be true. Uh, but the point is, there are limits. Okay. And Canada is well blessed in that space. Now, you ask about real estate, which is another matter. The share of total investment in the economy that's been going to housing has risen significantly over the last decade. I think this is a natural consequence of high levels of immigration and low rates of interest. So compare one country to another and say, oh, look, we have more investment in housing than that other country. Yeah, well, did you look to see if their population was growing? Well, no, it hasn't been, or it's been very growing very little. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with our immigration levels, we're growing by one percentage point or more per year. So we've got to invest more in housing. Now, of course, what we hope is that the rest of the economy will grow too, with investment there too. And because of energy in particular, the path hasn't been hasn't been a straight line. Uh, also, low rates of interest will, of course, boost housing as a share of the total, uh, especially given what we've been through. So, where it sorts out, it'll sort out differently from what you see today. But I think housing will remain an important uh, source of growth in the economy just because of immigration, even as rates rise. Yes. Yeah, even as rates rise. Um, let, let me just come back to technology for a second. I, you know, uh, again, you referenced it earlier. Um, you know, we've gone through, uh, and, and I, I think in, in previous conversations that you know, had, you, you know, you talked a little bit about some previous uh, technological revolutions. What could we, with some of the revolutions we're seeing today, learn from some of the previous ones that we've experienced? Well, this is indeed uh, one of the biggest of those tectonic forces I mentioned before. Uh, technology is all around us, and it's a persistent uh, force. It's like, uh, you know, the tectonic plates uh, in the Earth's crust. Uh, but only once in a while do we have a big upward leg in technology, okay? Big enough that economists call them industrial revolutions. So there have only been three in history. That's a steam engine, electricity, and a computer chip. Now, each of those things are not so important by themselves, but they are what we call general purpose technologies. It means everybody must adopt them right, because they're competition well. And so as they spread, the, the benefits are huge. Now, studying these events, as I do in the book, gives us a lot of insight into what might come next, because we're just beginning the fourth industrial revolution, and that's digitalization of our economy and the associated development of AI, right, and biotechnology. I mean, these are really big moves in what we'll be able to do um, as, as a society. Uh, what happens when new technology comes along is you adopt it in your company and it cuts your costs, right? You're able to change how you do things. And so cut your costs, you could have a bigger profit, which is cool. Or what happens is your competitor gets the same technology and right out there, they're trying to have your lunch, okay? They're <laughs> taking your customers away. So the competition means that the prices go down, okay? The benefits get spread around through lower prices. Now imagine mm -hmm. you're a company and your, the price of what you can charge for your business is going down and down, but you have debt and the debt stays exactly like it was. Well, that's those two ingredients, falling prices with existing debt. Those are the most important ingredients of a depression, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the ability to service the debt is declining all persistently and eventually the crunch day comes. Now, many of these ingredients were present in the early 2000s. We avoided a depression, but we had depressions from the first two industrial revolutions. We avoided the one from the computer chips, but we had jobless recoveries. We had the, the global financial crisis. So we still had volatility in, in different forms. So the fourth industrial revolution is expected to disrupt around 15% of the global workforce over the next few years. Hmm. That's a major shock for us to be prepared for. And so, and Steve, if I could actually dig a little deeper here. So, the if if I understand you correctly, we're we're kind of at the cusp of this in, um, a technological revolution. So we're going to experience again more progress in technology. So, and technology, as you mentioned, is by definition to some extent deflationary, 
right? So we have these deflationary forces and then all of us are seeing these inflationary forces that are right there in front of us. And, the, and you know, you and I talked about the fact there's a lot of noise in the system. Mm -hmm. So like based on your expertise, your understanding, like which of these forces are going to win out? Do we have deflationary, we have inflationary over the next three, five, 10 years? Like what, what, what's coming out ahead? Right. Well, it's a very tough call to make and that's the problem. Okay, you know, and I think that's why I came to think of it as a source of risk or volatility as opposed to, uh, a, you know, a, a trajectory that we could all find as predictable. The main thing is to understand that those cross currents you've named and others are in play and therefore to prepare our businesses or our portfolios for the unexpected. So it's because it's an environment where mistakes can easily happen. You know, imagine re making all those judgments that you just summarized there and deciding, oh, therefore, interest rates need to be this, or all other policies need to be that. Well, you know, chances are it's going to be wrong, right? So, but how much, or in which direction? I think the, the dominant force, as in past industrial revolutions, will be the deflationary forces coming mm -hmm. from the technology. Uh, what, during the third industrial revolution, what you saw was mainly Greenspan believing that there must be more productivity out there because prices aren't rising. So he kept interest rates low for far longer than anybody expected. Mm -hmm. And that was the right thing to do as a macroeconomic stabilization question. That allowed us to have more growth and jobs and all that stuff than none of the depression symptoms. But it did mean that we, did, we weren't prepared for the second order effects, which were the, the instability in the financial system and therefore, well, the, the global financial crisis. Now we've got a system that's a little more safe, right? We've got safeguards built in. I think the main thing is a couple of years from now, we'll be sitting around saying, gosh, inflation, you know, it's kind of kind of low. Eh? It's not, you know, like, it, like we were just uh, two or three years ago. Uh, the big counter trend that you didn't mention is deglobalization. I think uh, that de globalization was an important drag on inflation for the last 20 years. And that seems, it is not just gone. We might actually have deglobalization that, that kind of raises prices. And uh, that's geopolitical by source. Uh, we'll have to see how that goes. I'm hoping that companies can just de-risk their supply chains and keep some of those economic gains of supply chains. And, and how do you, um, on top of the, the factors that you mentioned, there's, as you said, there's lots of cross currents. We've also, we've seen you know, sort of unprecedented increases in the money supply. And on top of that, simultaneously, we've also seen increases in other forms of money supply, cryptocurrency and others. It'd be interesting, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how this unprecedented infusion and, and generally cryptocurrencies, how the central banks think about it is one of the questions that, that uh, popped into the chat. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, well, uh, it's a complicated question, of course. Now, uh, when, when we have all those ingredients of a depression, it's as if there is a crater underneath the economy. And uh, the risk is that we'll fall into it and then we'll have to walk along the bottom of it and climb out the other side. That's kind of a metaphor for a depression. Okay, so the deflation gets, takes root and then you can't resist it. The way you counter that is by essentially filling the crater up with money, uh, affectionately called liquidity. Mm -hmm. So if you fill the crater up with liquidity, then you can row your boat across it instead of walking along the bottom. So that's what happened, okay? And now we're at the, we're climbing up the other side now. The, the, the worst is behind us. And now it's central banks, part of that normalization can drain out that liquidity because we no longer need it. We're not gonna ride our boats in there anymore. Uh, so that, that's theoretically what, what needs to happen. Um, that, that, of course, has, has question marks around it, like, well, when is it, how fast do you do it, and all those things. Those are those judgments we talked about before, mm -hmm. and those cross currents will be hard to assess, and it's an error-prone situation. Mm -hmm. So as investors, you need to be prepared for unfortunate outcomes, but chances are it'll be okay. But be prepared for that. Remember, remember, the risks are, are higher than they've been for a long time. Now, uh, as for crypto, that's all a separate, separate matter, in my view. Um, you know, we have these, uh, these new, uh, we'll call them not, not currencies, uh, because they aren't actually currencies, but they're more like crypto assets, I guess. They're things that you can park your wealth in. 
And uh, if enough people cotton on to them, you know, there's a chance it will rise in value. Um, I, I think it's fairly, fairly close to gambling myself. So it is a, it's definitely a high risk uh, kind of strategy. Uh, but, but, you know, there may be merits there. I, you know, they, if at some point they become widespread, let's say pick Bitcoin for, the, for an example, mm -hmm. what I think is central banks will introduce uh, their own cryptocurrencies. And, you know, when you, when you have the choice between one that's issued by a known central bank and, and is obviously a reliable thing, as opposed to something that's highly volatile, well, you're going to maybe continue to ride that little bit of volatility for other purposes, but not for your day-to-day -day transactions. Right. Right. So it's a, uh, it's a card right now it's in a gray zone and we'll, we'll watch it unfold with a lot of interest. But the central banks are getting themselves ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, uh, that's interesting. I want to come back. We were just talking about the Canadian economy and there's one thing I wanted to ask you. I just neglected to do so, you know, obviously, um, one of the big themes for investors today, impact, ESG, environmental conscientiousness, which uh, is, is sort of tricky in, a, in an energy rich economy, a resource rich economy. Um, wh what do you think most people are underestimating or overestimating vis-a-vis -vis environmental concerns and, and the interplay with the environment and the economy? Wow. Well, that's, that's a question, all right, Mo. Uh, <laughs> it's probably the biggest question mark that we face in our business environment. Governments are having difficulty laying out a path from here to 2050. I mean, you saw at mm -hmm. COP26 um, how, how, how much jockeying was going on in the, the negotiations, and, and you saw some things got decided. But And I remind you that it was called COP26 because it's the 26th time right that they've met to do this so that's at the international level but it's no simpler at the domestic level we have multiple levels of government and uh no one's going to simply just just agree on a path but what does impress me is how investors have embraced net zero so not just investors are saying uh, look i want my portfolio to be consistent with net zero by 2050 make it happen so you know that's what the portfolio managers are doing Banks and pension funds are signing on. So that means you're intermediaries. So if you're a company doing whatever you are doing, your bank is saying, well, wait a minute, show me your carbon footprint. Show me how you're going to progress it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's an accountability that's emerging there. And, uh, and so if everybody, every company makes it to net zero, I think we can get to net zero, even if governments can't agree on all the things that uh, they're going to do. So I think people are underestimating just how difficult that transition to net zero emissions will be. It's a lot more than just switching to an electric car, which is kind of how a lot of folks kind of summarize it. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of facts I'll, I'll throw at you. Um, over 80% of global energy needs today come from fossil fuels, mm -hmm. over 80%. And there are over 3 billion people in the world who do not even have access to electricity or gas for heating or cooking, three billion. Well, they're not just gonna to switch to an electric car. They don't even dream of cars, okay? The global demand for energy was not gonna stay constant. It's gonna go up by like 50, 60% over those same 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. So just meeting that increase in demand with pure green sourcing, that will be a huge accomplishment for the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Even with some outright switching in countries like ours, you know, to, to be increasingly green in our, in our sources, we'll leave at least 40 or 50 percent of global energy needs depending on fossil fuels in 2050. <laughs> and we all watch Star Trek. You know, on Star Trek, there's everything's made of plastic. That all comes from uh, good old Canadian oil. So, you know, you know, there's still going to be value in these in these resources. The only way in my mind to reconcile our green aspirations with our carbon backbone is carbon capture. Mm -hmm. That's taking the notion of net seriously. Some people just reduce that to not net zero, just zero. We just won't use those things anymore. I really don't think that's practical. I think they're underestimating what sort of a convulsion uh, mm -hmm. that could create in the global economy. Interesting. Hey, you mentioned three billion people that have no access to electricity and, you know, in a slightly smaller way at the domestic level, you know, when we think about, I'm actually curious on your thoughts on, on inequality and rising inequality is, is there, is there any way 
that we get out of this uh, in, in a inequality quagmire without revolution or some really aggressive redistribution tax policy? <laughs> well, you've just laid out uh, the, the two ends of the uh, of the possibilities. I hope there are many options in between. That's, well, that's <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> yeah, revolution or uh, you know anyway. So it, it, you're right. You put your finger on a really important trend. Uh, uh, just over seventy percent of uh, of global citizens have seen rising income inequality over the last decade. It's not necessarily an old problem. It's it's a brand new problem. It's getting worse as we sit here. And uh, so what happens is actually in every one of our past three industrial revolutions, there's been an increase in inequality. Uh, very basic reason is that uh, when you put a new technology in place, you, economists think of it as causing like yeast to spread around and everybody gets some. But in fact, what happens is the benefits of new technology are more like mushrooms. They just sort of <laughs> pop up and those big companies can just grab their mushroom, right? Mm. And so inequality goes up in the first few years of an industrial revolution. So it's going to get worse than what you've described. The mm -hmm. share of total income going to labor now is at an historic low. You can go back to Piketty's book and see when the big movements happened. Uh, this is even, it's even lower than that. So that's the same as saying that profit margins are the highest level in recorded history. I think this rising inequality is fueling the feeling of being left out. It's causing the anti-globalization movement. It's causing political polarization. It's making it really hard for governments to make good policy, including income redistribution policy. So are the odds that they can, can redistribute in a way? Can they do that without political consensus? Very hard to know. But I basically, I see what the aging of the population at the same time, market power is shifting to the worker as we speak. So I expect to see that somehow get resolved, whether the threat of a renaissance in labor unions, and you see some companies in the United States preempting labor unions by offering better wage packages and other benefits to their employees, Walmart and so on like this. Uh, we may see more of that kind of reaction, and that would mean that the aggregate profit margin would go down and the share of income going to labor might go up. So there may be a, a market discipline kind of force that causes it to happen without a revolution hmm. or a massive uh, government intervention. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I was actually asking for what, how you saw it outside of those two <laughs> Well, extremes. I see it. I see companies kind of taking it on. Yeah, yeah. You know, the companies will say, you know, look, uh, like, for example, right now, people's like, costs are rising. And that's going to pass through like, even higher inflation. But well, wait a minute, not necessarily. If if profit margins are already really high, you know, uh, a company could say, "Well, no, I'm not going to pass that through. I can I can protect my customers. My customers are stakeholders too, not right. just my shareholders, right?" So we'll right. see. We'll see. And 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 so just thinking about. Uh, Broadly, like again, we've talked about inflation, we've talked about labor. It, when you think about how should we be thinking about today's debt levels and rising rates? Are there, um, let me leave it there. How yeah, you... yeah, look, we, we, we sure racked up a lot of debt in the last couple of years, that's for sure. Um, importantly, we've been there before, like right after World War II, and somehow we managed to grow out of it. Back when I was a kid, you know, that legacy of debt that was left after World War II, that was never mentioned around my house. Like I, you know, I never felt like I was growing up under this overhang of debt. We grew out of that uh, back then. And of course we had a lot of extra growth because of the baby boom. So that helped. Um, we can do that again if we put our minds to it. Interest rates are way lower these days. Uh, interest service uh, for the government is about one fifth or so of what it was in 1994. So there's there's a lot of room to maneuver there. So for, for it to be sustainable, all we really need to do is make sure our trend growth rate is high enough to make the debt service easy. And I think that means focusing on doing some of those things that will boost productivity growth and boost the trend line for the economy. It includes, by the way, in, in bringing in immigrants. That, that's an important source of our growth. And it means doing things like childcare because that will also boost our economic growth. It also means taking away some of those red tape, uh, the, the restrictions, the cross-provincial 
uh, differences in regulations. Those are things that slow our growth down. Uh, those are big moves. Um, so in the absence of those big moves, uh, which, which would require a lot of uh, political will and a lot of leadership that I don't yeah. necessarily see today, uh, uh, do you believe in the absence of those that we're in for a slower future growth? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, in the absence of those, uh, we'll be cutting it close, let's say. I think that we can grow, you know, one percent from immigration and say another one percentage point from, you know, productivity growth. OK, mm -hmm. that, that, so that's two percent. And if we have two percent inflation, that means headline growth of four percent. That's the revenue line for the for the economy and therefore for the government. Because tax revenues will automatically grow at that. So that means that as long as interest rates that the government's paying are under 4%, the debt level is sustainable. In fact, it will fall as a share of the economy steadily through time. Uh, but we can boost that growth by half a point. It makes a big difference to that equation. Sure. So that's why I think it's, it's worth, even if there's small things that we can agree on, it's worth doing that and not just waiting until we get the perfect uh, outcome. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, look, there's a lot of fascinating dynamics you referenced. I'd be interested um, in the market, I'd be interested to, to hear your thoughts on who might be some of the winners and who might be some of the losers in that environment. And I guess the, the perhaps the easiest way to frame that is if, if let's say, um, I know you have lots of roles, first of all, with Osler as a special advisor, you sit on a lot of boards, but let's just say today you accepted the role of chief investment officer for a large pool of, of capital, private, institutional, whatever it is. How would you think about capital allocation differently today than you may have five, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, well, that's the, that's the money question, isn't it? Um, well, we, we know from past industrial revolutions roughly how it's likely to work. That the winners will be those who deploy the new technology first, okay? There's a major first mover advantage, so it's a bit of a race. And if you sit back and watch to see if your competitors uh, are gonna do it, well, uh, you'll be last. Uh, given the future shortage of workers, I think the winners will also be those who attract and retain the best workers. That, that it'll feel like you're giving away some of that profit margin, but that's a form of risk and mitigation or insurance against losing them because I think it's gonna get ultra competitive uh, for the right workers out there in the next few years. And given that the macro environment will be more volatile than we're used to, higher risk, the winners will be those who can turn risk into return, okay? Risk management. You know, if you look at a thing and say, well, that's too, that's too risky. I need a high rate of return. I'm not going to do it. And your competitor might say, I know that's risky, but I've got the best kind of staff for managing that. I bet I can achieve a higher rate of return out of that risk after adjusting for risk. And so that risk management practice will be an important contributor to the returns. Mm -hmm. And as an investor, that means you got to look for all these things. Okay, stock picking, I think, will become once again a profitable occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think index investing will do far less well uh, because the macro environment will be challenging. Nothing will go in a straight line, but beneath the surface, there will be major success stories with the characteristics mm -hmm. that I mentioned. And as for households, I think households are likely to maintain a higher level of savings. There's a bigger buffer than they have in the past. We're always already seeing signs of that now. And, uh, and so that they can ride out, uh, you know, temporary bouts of unemployment. It'll be, it'll be unemployment punctuated with scrambling for workers, you know, kind of this volatility uh, that makes it hard for you to, uh, to manage your affairs without more of a buffer. Right, right. And, and just to wrap up this conversation of risk, um, what keeps you up at night? Like, what do you see as the greatest risks that we're facing today, which we didn't already touch on? Well, oh, I sleep like a baby. <laughs> I, I wake up every two hours screaming. <laughs> uh, no, it's an old joke. But anyway, my biggest, my biggest concern is of a, of a new financial crisis uh, originating somewhere like in an emerging market setting. So in this pandemic, I mean, everybody's gotten hit the same way and all countries have tried to deal with COVID in roughly the same way. But not all of them had the same institutional depth or the same financial depth that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. So I look at 
countries like big countries like Brazil or India see just how strained they are given the experience and it's not over yet. And that that is what I worry about having another crisis that could look say like kind of like if you remember the Asian financial crisis mm -hmm. in the late 90s that thing spread to Latin America and then it spread to Russia by 98 but it was like a one year period of you know craziness in the markets. But I'll counter that with my source of optimism, and that is technological progress. I'm, I'm old enough to live between the second industrial revolution and the third, and to see that third unfold in its entirety. And I can hardly believe what has changed in my lifetime. And I think this is gonna happen again over the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years. You've heard me say volatility and risk a few times today, but you just remember that risk is two-sided. Okay, when you hear risk, it sounds bad, but risk is actually two sided that there's good luck as well as bad luck out there. And those big dollops of good luck are going to be highly progressive for society. So, I happen to think that actually the good luck is going to outweigh the bad luck, even yeah. if it's risky. Well, no, I love that optimism. I love that optimism. So, I think we'll have time for just one more question. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just putting aside the macro environment. Just thinking about Steve and, and what brought you to this point, when you think about the, and I ask all of our guests this question, the, the, the best piece of advice or wisdom that anyone has ever imparted on you, uh, what comes to mind? Well, um, I, I, I think given everything that I've done, what I know is I didn't do any of it by myself, you know, and I, and I, that was kind of drilled into me at a young, young stage, but I think, I learned it best actually from, from television programs. Okay, I'll be honest. Okay, so my, <laughs> my leader, my leader uh, models are like Jean Luc Picard uh, from, uh, from Star Trek The Next Generation or Jed Bartlett from the West Wing, you know, President Bartlett. I mean, these are extraordinary leaders. And what you know from all of that is they, they're, they're just one of the gang. Okay, and the gang would lay down in front of a train for them because. He, that, those leaders really care about their people. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I just think that, that that basic bit of advice, take the high road, treat your people as if family is first, but always take the high road because the view is always better from up there. Uh, those kind of bits of uh, wisdom really carry a long way. It meant that uh, so many other folks were willingly on my team and working towards the same things. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot more done than I ever could have done. Steve, that was amazing, wonderful. Like, thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing your incredible insights with us and being, you know, really so gracious and generous with your time and wisdom. Um, we really appreciate it and hope we could do it again soon. Yeah, well, Mo, look, it was a pleasure. Uh, you had some great questions there, it made, me, it made me work. So I uh, appreciate that. <laughs> you did your homework really well. So thank you, uh, thank you for all of that. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch, yes. Yeah, no, I, Thank you. And so for all of our participants, thank you as well for joining us. If you haven't donated yet, please do so by going to the Lunches with Legends page um, so that we can continue strengthening pediatric mental health in our communities. To Steve and everyone else on the call, thanks again for your support of Lunches with Legends and wishing each of you a fantastic day. Thank you.